Lecture 19, Milton, Paradise Lost. In the invitation to Book One of Paradise Lost, the muse, the poet calls upon his muse for inspiration, and he says he will pursue things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme. At this moment, Milton consciously takes on all his most important predecessors in the epic tradition, Homer, Virgil, Dante, Ovid, Spencer, and he intends to outdo them all. From a young age, Milton seems to have planned a long poem, which he hoped would end up being a celebration of Puritan Reformation in England. He had in mind a national epic, perhaps based on Arthurian material rather than biblical, but of course that would have called for the celebration of an earthly king, and that Milton's Republican ideals could not support. He settles finally on a sacred theme, a biblical theme, for his epic, which features not an earthly king, an earthly court, or a legendary national hero, but Adam and Eve, the mythic figures of biblical history. So his subject will be universal history, not any specific national history. Milton had considered writing a tragic drama on the fall of man. He thought about writing a tragedy. There are several drafts for such a work in his notes. But he finally chose an epic form in which to assert eternal providence and the promise of redemption. It's a strange subject for epic. How had he come to this decision? In order to answer that question, we need to place Milton's career, both his politics and his poetics, in historical context. John Milton was born born in 1608 under James I, but he grew up during the reign of Charles I. He had a hum rigorous humanist education. He knew all the important classical languages, Latin, Greek, Hebrew, and also all the major European languages. He studied at Cambridge and then retired for a period of six years, a period he called his studious retirement, during which he read everything that was worth knowing under the sun. He read history, literature, political theory, astronomy, mathematics. John Milton was an extremely learned man. He toured the continent in 1638-39, during which time he met a good many of the great intellectuals of his day, including Galileo. When he returned, he became immersed in the political and religious conflict then gripping England. Although Milton published a book of poems at mid-century in 1645, it's a collection that includes poems in both English and Latin, Milton was not much known as a poet during his lifetime. It really wasn't until some time later, some years after his death, that Milton's poetic achievement came to be recognized for the great achievement it was. He was better known during his lifetime as a political writer. And he's very different from a figure like Shakespeare, about whose political and religious views we know almost nothing. With Shakespeare, we know what his characters say, but we don't know a thing about what Shakespeare himself says on politics, religion. Milton, by contrast, left a paper trail. His prose works fill some eight volumes. Many of those writings are political. Now, the general historical context for understanding John Milton is the English Reformation and Revolution. During the reign of Elizabeth I, the Puritans, the Presbyterians, were pressing for Reformation in uh, England, wanted to extend the Reformation in England, and later, under James and Charles, conflict between the King and Parliament continued to grow. It intensified. In that conflict, John Milton was on the side of Parliament and the Puritans, and he stood against the monarchy and the established Anglican Church. What Milton wanted was a political and religious reformation in England. Milton saw himself as a national prophet. He had a strong sense of his prophet's mission. He's quite conscious of his status as prophet in Paradise Lost. If you look at the invocation to book three, there are four important invocations in Paradise Lost in books one, three, seven, and nine. They're important. They give us a clear insight into Milton's purposes in writing this epic. In the invocation to book three, Milton writes himself into a tradition of blind prophets, which includes, of course, Homer. 
Milton saw the end of monarchy as an opportunity for England to claim a new age of freedom, to claim a new freedom for itself in which human beings would be governed not by monarchs and kings, not by priests, not by prelates, bishops, but by reason and divine truth as revealed in the Bible. There's a high militancy in John Milton. He had passionate religious and political commitments. He was a dedicated defender of liberty, of republicanism, and of freedom of conscience. And during the 1640s and 1650s, Milton was engaged in a kind of pamphlet war, writing political tracts in defense of those ideals. In the early 1640s, Milton wrote and published a number of tracts against church government by the bishops, which Milton saw as a kind of religious tyranny over the lives of the English people. In this period, Milton also produced several tracts arguing for the justifiability of divorce. He wanted to liberalize the divorce laws, making divorce possible on grounds of incompatibility. And in Areopagitica in 19, 1644, which is probably Milton's most well-known political uh, prose, prose work, Milton defended the free press against censorship. Now, civil war had broken out in 1642. By late 1648, early 1649, the parliament parliamentarians had ultimately emerged victorious, and Charles I was brought to trial. Milton now saw the possibility of political liberty for his country. Now, problems had been brewing for some time, and the origins of the Civil War are a very complex matter, and I can't begin to give you a detailed account of its sources. But briefly, there are many different religious and political factions uh, in changing configurations, trying either to reform the church or to redefine the nature of sovereignty, which is to say the relative balance of power between king and parliament. The sources of this conflict are complex, but just to give you an idea, the Stuart kings, James and Charles, had made parliament angry by abusing their power. They dismissed parliaments. They would call for unapproved taxes. They also made the Puritans angry by making way for the return of Catholicism in England. Uh, Charles, after all, had married a Catholic. In January of 1649, Charles I was executed. The monarchy and the House of Lords were abolished, and for 11 years, from 1649 to 1660, England was a republic. Even when... Uh, uh, from early 1659, the return of the monarchy was uh, just around the corner and preparations for the restoration of the king were underway, Milton continued to argue in favor of republican liberty. Uh, think of it, he's fought his whole life against the king. Charles II is about to return. What does Milton do? He writes a tract defending the act of regicide. On the eve of the return of Charles II in 1660, Milton defends the regicide in a tract called The Ready and Easy Way to Defend, to Establish a Free Commonwealth. He identified himself with the biblical prophet Jeremiah, as if he would tell the very soil itself what her perverse inhabitants are deaf to, as they prepared to thrust their necks back into the yoke of monarchy. Now, Milton was many things, but he was not a timid man. He was briefly imprisoned, placed under arrest. Uh, fortunately, he was released before a short time. He seems to have res resisted efforts to release him. But friends of his, including the English poet Andrew Marvell, won his release. So Milton's career as a political prose writer represented a fight for ecclesiastical, domestic, and social liberty. He was suspicious of political and ecclesiastical forms of authority, appealing instead to the authority of the Bible. Now, Milton was concerned throughout his life with three central ideals, virtue, liberty, and reason. Though the relations among those three principles changes during, they change during the course of the career, and I'd like briefly to give you some sense of that change because it bears directly on Paradise Lost. It will provide some useful background to Paradise Lost. It will place the poem in the context of the development of Milton's ethical thinking, that is, his thinking about the relationship between good and evil. The young Milton begins as a learned idealist. He's a bookish young man who believes that virtue is irresistible.
That idealism appears in some of the early works, like the Nativity Ode, on the morning of Christ's nativity, or the mask, Comus. A mask is a form of elaborate court entertainment, often allegorical. In Comus, Milton writes, Virtue could see to do what virtue would by her own radiant light. Virtue is here entirely self-sufficient and efficacious. Both here and in the Nativity Ode, the idea is that in the face of evil, in the face of virtue, evil will recoil upon itself of its own accord. But Milton develops a new, more demanding model for thinking about ethics, for thinking about good and evil in Areopagitica. It's important because this model will later appear in the scheme of Paradise Lost. In Areopagitica, Milton argues that reason allows human beings to find truth through the experience of good and evil. This is not the irresistibility of virtue and truth, but the possibility of gaining truth through free choice. Virtue consists in choosing. He writes, Good and evil in the field of this world grow up together almost inseparably. Given this situation, he argues, we must sally forth into the world, testing our virtue in an effort to make the right choices. Milton declares, I cannot praise a cloistered virtue. Virtue unassayed for Milton means nothing. And that's an argument that Eve herself will use in Book 9 of Paradise Lost when she expresses her desire to go off to another part of the garden, to tend uh, another part of the garden, separate herself from, Eden, uh, from Adam. She will say virtue unassailed, unassayed uh, means nothing. And she's right. It's a good Miltonic argument. So Milton discovers that truth is scattered. It has to be found, it has to be picked up, brushed off, put back together. This is the, a very different idea from his youthful idealism, the idea that virtue is irresistible. Life is rather a matter of trial and difficult choices. He writes, We bring not innocence into the world, we bring impurity. That which purifies us is trial, and trial is by what is contrary. Virtue, that is, must con continually be tested. One must live and act in a world in which good and evil are ambiguously intermixed. The truth has to be discovered through struggle and free choice. This is the central theme of Paradise Lost. Even in Eden before the fall, you'll notice Adam and Eve have to make choices every minute of the day. Without challenge, without temptation, virtue would mean nothing. Milton insists on the human responsibility to make choices. He stresses the importance of the free exercise of reason in the pursuit of truth. In this regard, Milton is different from the Calvinist Puritans who tend to denigrate reason. Milton places a great value in reason, whereas the Puritans, the Calvinists, tended to um, stress the impotence of reason, the absolute corruption of the human will. So, the ethical and theological principle of Paradise Lost appears in Book 3 when God explains that Satan was sufficient to have stood, but free to fall. Freedom of choice stands at the heart of the Miltonic universe. Now, by 1660, of course, England had made the wrong choice, according to Milton. The revolution had failed. The monarchy had been restored. The hoped-for paradise in England now seemed impossible. At this point in his career, Milton redefines the terms of the struggle. No longer is politics the primary ground of God's plan. Now the primary go ground of God's plan is the individual human soul. By the end of his career, Milton is a defeated revolutionary who stresses the values of patience, heroic fortitude, and temperance. We see these values dramatized in Paradise Lost. Now, Paradise Lost represents, of course, the loss of paradise to Satan, but Milton also has in mind an England fallen on evil days, as he says in the Invocation to Book 7. That is, England has again embraced the monarchy, and papist pat practices with the restoration of the Stuart kings. After the restoration, Milton was politically cut off. He was a kind of exile living in his own country. He's not unlike the biblical Samson in his last poem, Samson Agonistes. It's a marvelous poem depicting a blind, 
long-suffering hero who endures his defeat in patience and heroic fortitude. Dark, dark, dark amid the blaze of noon, Samson sits. He's not unlike John Milton himself. So in Paradise Lost, we have the greatest epic in English about the greatest rebellion written by a defeated revolutionary. His subject will be new to epic. His concern will be the entire history of the created universe, right? From creation to the end of time. And it will include the loss of paradise and the future history of salvation. This is very different from epics based on a single national history like Virgil's Aeneid, which is about the founding of the Roman Empire. Let's turn to the poem. I'd like to say a word first about verse and genre. While the poem is in English, it can often seem like it's in Greek or Latin. The diction, the word choice, is uh, unusual. It often includes Latin meanings in the English words. It's not important to be a trained Latinist to read the poem, but it is useful to know that Milton uses his knowledge of other languages in a sense to put poetic pressure on English, often to the most dazzling effect. Milton's syntax is often inverted. Subjects, verbs, objects don't always appear in linear sequence. They're inverted, and sometimes many lines of poetry come in between those main grammatical elements. So the syntax takes a little sorting out, but you'll quickly get the hang of it as you read. And you'll discover in the process that the very things that make Milton challenging to read are also responsible for producing the most remarkable linguistic effects. There's no verse that sounds like Milton's in Paradise Lost. T.S. Eliot would later compare Milton to James Joyce. He said they are both blind musicians writing work based on English. The literary genre of Paradise Lost is epic. What is epic? Well. It's a long narrative poem. It's on an important subject. Its style is elevated, it's lofty style, and it portrays a heroic, sometimes uh, even partly divine figure whose action has important consequences for a people, for a nation, or in the case of Paradise Lost, the, uh, the, the human race itself. Epic tends to include certain general features a hero of great importance. Here we have uh, various heroes of, one could say, universal importance. S great deeds in battle. Gods or supernatural figures who intervene in the action of the poem. A lofty style. Milton's poem includes all of those things. Epic also exhibits certain poetic conventions. The epic argument at the beginning of the poem. Sing, muse, the wrath of Achilles in Iliad. In Milton's poem of man's first disobedience, and it goes on for some lines, laying out the argument of the epic. The invocation of the muse, another convention of epic we get in the beginning. The epic tends to begin in medias race, that is to say, in the middle of things. After the invocation to book one, we're in hell after the rebel angels have been cast out from heaven. So this is after the birth of sin in heaven and the rebellion, the war in heaven. We begin in the middle of things. Epic is the most ambitious of genres. Uh, critics who study the history of genre, people like Rosalie Coley or Barbara Lewalski, point out that Renaissance critical theory defined epic as a compendium of all subjects, all forms, all styles. Epic is a kind of encyclopedic poem that purports to contain a kind of universal knowledge. It, it tries to comprehend all the best that is known in the world. This epic tries to do nothing less than to represent the entire universe. Homer's poems were seen this way. The Bible, too, was a kind of epic. The Bible, after all, represents all of history. And in a sense, every subject, every literary genre, right? You've got law, history, prophecy, proverb, allegory, epistle, tragedy, heroic poetry, ancestral stories, and so on. And the Bible embraces all time from the creation to the last judgment. Paradise Lost may be seen to do a similar thing. It embraces all of history and all the best that is known of the world and all poetic forms. And Milton transforms every genre he touches.
Milton could be, uh, Paradise Lost, rather, could be said to contain a kind of curriculum of Western literature. It draws on, but also transforms a wide variety of literary forms, a wide variety of modes of writing. Now, the tradition of epic is, of course, central to Milton's concerns, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But let me just give you an idea of some of the other genres that are included in the poem. The genre of romance. After all, in Paradise Lost, we have a garden, and it's a place of love and immortality. Right? That is the quintessential space of the genre of romance. Arthurian romance offers us nightly quests, right? Well, Satan's journey in search of new worlds is something like a nightly quest. It has some of that quality. Paradise Lost also includes the genre of pastoral with its idyllic landscapes. It includes lyric. It's got songs of praise and thanksgiving. You may recall the biblical psalms. It's got uh, an epithalamian, that is to say, a wedding song, and it has various lyric laments. It also includes several forms of drama, not least tragedy. Remember Milton thought originally of casting his work about the fall of man in the form of tragedy. We have tragic protagonists, and they offer tragic soliloquies. Satan and Adam both, right? They recall the great tragic heroes of the Renaissance English stage. You think of uh, Dr. Faustus, Macbeth. Those solilo soliloquies in Paradise Lost are worthy of that dramatic tradition. You have a kind of farce when Satan returns or escapes hell and uh, meets sin and death, who happen to be his wife and son, right? It's a grotesque scene. I mean, they're the, the ultimate dysfunctional family, Satan, sin, and death. And it's a kind of farce scene. Uh, Adam and Eve take part later in a kind of domestic tragedy in Book 9, the, the, the Book of the Fall. After the fall, they're involved in sort of mutual recriminations. It's a uh, nasty business. Most importantly, however, we recognize in the poem a recapitulation and transformation of past epics. What do you think of? The Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid. Let me say a word about each one. Like Homer's Iliad, Paradise Lost has a tragic epic subject. Here, the tragedy resulting from a calamitous act of disobedience. And as in the Iliad, we have in Satan a hero driven by a sense of injured merit. Remember Achilles in book one of and the Iliad, he's, he's, honor has been um, slighted by Agamemnon, and he vows revenge, in effect. Satan, too, uh, acts out of a sense of injured merit, a desire for individual glory, what Milton will call in Book 9, a lust for glory soul. We also have in Paradise Lost a rewriting of the journey of Odysseus in Satan's voyage to Earth. Like Odysseus, Satan journeys into unknown lands. Like Odysseus, Satan also goes away from home, quote-unquote, his new home in hell, in order to return, like Odysseus, to his wife and son. Some see in Satan a kind of grotesque perversion of a Moses figure. He's a would-be deliverer of his people out of bondage. Like Odysseus, Satan is full of wiles, full of craftiness, full of resourcefulness. Like Odysseus, he's a master of disguises, and he's a great talker. Right? He's a masterful rhetorician. The Aeneid. Like the journey of Virgil's Aeneas, the goal of Satan's journey is to found an empire. Not, in this case, Rome, the Roman Empire, but the Nether Empire, a Nether Empire on Earth. Now, it's significant that Satan is the character who's most closely associated with the heroic code of classical epic. It's Satan who exhibits the wrath of Achilles and the cunning resourcefulness of Odysseus. In Paradise Lost, Satan seeks individual fame and imperial power. These are the values of classical epic. And by associating Satan with this heroic ideology, Milton turns away from the values of classical and Renaissance epic. Now, in the invocation to Book Nine, we get an important statement of Milton's relation to the epic tradition he inherits. So it's a very important passage. He says that his account of the fall is not less but more heroic than the wrath of stern Achilles. He goes on to say that his subject matter and values are different 
from those of earlier epic. And he claims that certain values have not yet been represented in epic. These values for Milton are patience and heroic fortitude. Milton says in this passage that he's not inclined to write about the traditional subject of epic, which is war. Instead, he wants to sing of patience and heroic martyrdom. In Paradise Lost, then, Milton recasts the entire epic tradition. His epic is both more universal and more individualistic. It has a more interior focus. So we get a cosmic drama, but we also get a drama that takes place in the individual human soul. Paradise Lost represents a turning inward of the values of epic. He turns away from the martial values of the epic tradition in order to represent a new kind of epic struggle. It's an interior struggle, a spiritual struggle. Remember, this is the great age of uh, uh, spiritual autobiography. A lot of Puritans wrote them. There's a kind of interior focus in this kind of writing. And Milton offers that as well in Paradise Lost. So in Paradise Lost, we get a radical revision of the epic tradition. And one of the chief means by which Milton distances himself from the values of that earlier tradition is to make Satan their primary representative. I'm going to talk now a moment about the character of Satan. It's generated a lot of controversy. Now, there's very little in the Bible about Satan. For that matter, there's very little in the Bible about Adam and Eve. To read Milton's poem, you recognize how much he's elaborating the minimal evidence the Bible offers him. As in the case of Adam and Eve, Milton renders the character of Satan with immense psychological detail and, and of course, great poetic power. The character Milton creates in his Satan has produced a wide range of responses, which can be divided into two general categories, those readers who like Satan and those who don't, the pro and con. Those who see Satan as the true hero of the poem, who stress his courage, right? these are readers who are, of course, also shaped by an epic tradition. Those kinds of values are... Uh, worthy of admiration, and those who see Satan as selfish and foolishly proud. The anti-Satanist readers stress Satan's foolishness, his absurdity. Dr. Johnson, the great 18th century writer and critic, said this of Milton's Satan, the malignity of Satan foams in haughtiness and obstinacy, but his expressions are commonly general and no otherwise offensive than as they are wicked. For these readers, Satan's degeneration through the course of the poem, and he does degenerate. By book 10, one can no longer sustain the kind of admiration one might have had for him in the opening, say, four books. Satan's degeneration is the natural result of that disastrous decision to claim independence from God. Like the sinners in Dante's Inferno, Satan perverts the being he derives from God and he becomes a sort of parody of divine agency. He takes what's given him and perverts it in setting himself up as independent, denying his absolute dependence on God. So it seems fitting that Satan ends in Book 10 as a serpent. He's a kind of almost cartoon figure. There's something ludicrous about that scene when he and his cohorts are transformed into serpents and they're shown sort of snapping at the infernal fruit in a kind of grotesque parody of the fall. The pro-Satanist readers see in Satan something different. They see a kind of sublime and charismatic leader exhibiting a thrilling pride, a courage, and certainly great passion. The English Romantic poets give the fullest expression to that position. William Blake said, Milton's poetry was better when he was writing of, devil, of the devil and hell. Why? Because he was a true poet and of the devil's party without knowing it. For Blake, God and Christ are on the side of reason, discipline, right? The poet opposes those things, seeking instead energy, passion, desire, and who in the poem most embodies passion and desire? It's Satan. And the poetry is so thrilling, Milton must be on Satan's side. 
Milton cast a long shadow into the 19th century and beyond. All of the important English romantic writers were powerfully influenced by him and by Paradise Lost in particular. Keats, Wordsworth, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein owes a great debt to Milton's Paradise Lost. Remember that like Milton's Adam, the Frankenstein monster longs for a companion. Like Satan, the Frankenstein monster is rejected by his creator. Right? He becomes like Satan, bent on revenge. Evil thenceforth become my good, he says in chapter 24. He's quoting Satan from Paradise Lost in book four. Like Satan, the monster is tormented over being cast out, which is what's happened uh, uh, after the rebellion in heaven. It's an interesting scene in Mary Shelley's novel. Uh, it makes a direct allusion to Paradise Lost. Remember that the Frankenstein monster learns language from watching other people through a little chink in the woodshed. Right? Later, he's out walking along in the woods or something. He sees a knapsack. And he picks it up and finds three books in that knapsack. They are Plutarch's Lives of the Noble Grecians and Romans, Goethe's Sorrows of Young Werther, and what else? Milton's Paradise Lost, right? He's interested in Paradise Lost. Why? Because Paradise Lost is about the relationship between the creator and the creature, right? One would heartily think, looking at the movie versions of Frankenstein, right, the Boris Karloff version, whose monster has verbal skills that are minimal, to say the least, right? That, Milton's, that Mary Shelley's Frankenstein monster reads Milton in French. <laughs> The divided response to Satan captures an ambivalence embodied in the poem itself. One doesn't have to be a romantic reader to recognize a sublime greatness in Satan. The poetry is wonderful. And I think Milton has an interest in presenting Satan to elicit our awe, certainly, and even to some extent our sympathy. Why? He wants us to understand what Satan has lost. The sublime magnificence of Satan reminds us of what he was in heaven, of his former stature in heaven. Even though it's now perverted, Milton has a dramatic interest in making us see, understand that dangerous attractiveness. It derives in part from his angelic status. Milton, I think, also wants to test us. The poem subjects the reader to trial, tests the reader by making Satan an ambivalent character, right? He's characterized both by a kind of bold, charismatic heroism on the one hand, and a stubborn and evil malice. Like Dante's reader, the reader of Paradise Lost undergoes a kind of practical education. We're put at risk of being seduced, in effect, by him. But we're also, it should, it should bear in mind, we're also given the materials from early on in the poem to make the correct theological judgment of Satan. But Milton could very easily have made Satan a less attractive figure. He doesn't do that, right? Instead, he produces around the figure of Satan a complex modulation of emotion. We don't always know quite, or we can't help ourselves, but respond to Satan at times with a kind of thrill and admiration at his magnificence. Why? Again, I think he wants to make it difficult for us. He wants to put us in the difficult position of having to make right choices when those choices are not always easy. That which purifies us is trial. Remember Milton in Areopagitica. Milton insists on the value of temptation by trial. His portrait of Satan tries our ability to choose, to make the correct judgments. It's not an easy thing to do. We're, we're caught. At times, Satan is hard to resist. Why? Well, he exhibits like we do often, sort of self-division, torment, kind of anguish. Satan, in that regard, is more like us, at least before the fall, before Adam and Eve fall. Satan is more like us than any other character in the poem. We're made to feel his inner conflict and, and his despair in a way that makes simple judgment difficult at times, right? So Milton puts us in a position, in effect, of having to make difficult moral choices even as we read, right? The poem is itself is a kind of moral testing ground. Now, Milton has to present Satan this way for theological reasons as well. He must show in Satan, uh, show Satan showing this uncertainty, this anguish, because he has to show that Satan has free will. 
right? When you see Satan waver, as he does on occasion, we're being shown his faculty of free will. Satan isn't forced to do what he does, to make the decisions he does. He's not forced to leap from heaven. In fact, the sun in his chariot and the war of heaven reigns in his horses at the moment he, he, the rebel angels are forced to the brink of heaven, but he doesn't push them off. The rebel angels jump of their own accord. Right? So it's important that Milton represents Satan as having free choice. Right? Hadst thou the same free will and power to stand? Thou hadst, he says. At this point, he acknowledges that he chose and chose freely. And his problem, of course, is that he commits himself time and again to making the wrong choice. He commits himself with new resolve to evil. Farewell remorse, all good to me is lost. Evil, be thou my good. Here we see Satan, as he will on more than one occasion, make perverse choices, right? Freely choosing again and again, to commit himself to evil. But bear in mind that Milton gives us cues from the beginning about how we should be responding to Satan. You'll notice in Satan's thinking about God, Satan can conceive of God only as the thunderer. <laughs> That's his epithet for God. God's power has nothing to do with justice. It has nothing to do with righteousness. It has simply to do with the fact that God has the heavy artillery, right? The thunderer. He doesn't understand anything else. He, God's power is established by simple custom and sheer physical power. And you'll notice that Milton again and again associates Satan with tyranny of a, of a kind of Eastern potentate variety. He, talk, he talks about his monarchal pride, his pomp supreme, right? He's a very puffed up, tyrannical kind of monarch, Satan is. Now, he's the perverse hero of the poem, a hero, a perverse one. What are the other models of heroism in the poem? We get several, notably the angel Abdiel. Abdiel is the faithful angel who stands alone against the rebel angels at the end of book five. He's sort of the one just man. He's in some ways a kind of surrogate figure from Milton himself who stands against his compatriots who are welcoming the Stuart kings back to England. Abdiel stands among the faithless, faithful only he. His loyalty he kept, his love, his zeal. Abdiel exhibits precisely the kind of heroic fortitude, the patient obedience, which is the very definition of heroism in Paradise Lost. Adam is a kind of hero, as is Christ. Christ will, of course, later display Adam's brand of heroism in the redemption. And it will be Adam's task to live up to its standard. Right? Let me move on now to Milton's Eden in order to give you a sense of what's interesting about it. Milton's Eden is a sensuous place. It's a sensuous garden. But it's important to understand that it's not a land of the lotus eaters. Right? It's a vital place. It's a dynamic place. It's a, yes, a pastoral garden. Yes, a realm of pleasures. But it's not a place for lazy people. Right? You'll notice that Adam and Eve aren't sort of lying around uh, smelling the roses. They're tending the garden. They're doing little horticultural projects. Right? Martha Stewart would be proud. They're always active doing little garden projects right? in a kind of holy rapture. Milton's paradise also embraces the senses, the passions, and sexuality. Sexuality is very much part of pre-Lapsarian Eden, Eden before the fall. Sex doesn't arise after the fall. It's very much part of Eden before the fall. So Milton's Eden is a place of erotic as well as rational companionship. Milton defends physical love in marriage. Let's move on to Adam and Eve and say a word about their domestic politics. One of the most important questions in Paradise Lost has to do with the domestic politics between Adam and Eve and the gender roles assigned these two figures. Recently, critics have done a lot of interesting work on this question. Now, there's no question that Milton adopts what's effectively a, essentially a Pauline model of domestic hierarchy. Not equal as their sex not equal seemed, 
He for God only, she for God in him. But there are passages in which Milton does something different. He presents not a hierarchical model, but an egalitarian model, a model of mutuality. Readers have recognized for some time that the poem is a little bit ambiguous on this count. I don't think the hierarchy is ever undermined. It's there. There's no question. But Milton puts pressure on it in interesting ways. There's a tension between the hierarchical and the egalitarian models for understanding the relationship between Adam and Eve. So Milton adds an elaborate psychological drama to what is, if you look back at Genesis, a very spare narrative account. He adds in the process some very interesting complexity uh, to the relations between Adam and Eve. Note, for instance, that Eve, who is in relative terms the creature of appetite, it's important to understand she's rational too, she's just slightly less so than Adam. They're both rational, reasonable creatures. But I'm speaking in relative terms. Eve, the creature of appetite, eats why? To be wise. She seeks knowledge. Why does Adam eat of the fruit? He eats out of love for Eve. Right? It's a very interesting sort of inversion of what one might expect. So pay attention to the psychological dynamics in Adam and Eve, both before and after the fall. It's one of the most interesting aspects of Paradise Lost. Milton gives such psychological detailing to Adam and Eve that they would really be at home in a novel. Let me say a last word about Eden and history, the relationship between Eden and history. Notice that the poem includes two primary narratives. On the one hand, you have the cosmic narrative, uh, the epic struggle between God and Satan, between the sun and the rebel angels. That narrative, the cosmic narrative, establishes the overall structure for the poem. It gives us the providential direction and history for the poem. On the other hand, we have the Adam and Eve narrative. And that takes place in a much more intimate, a much more private realm. So we move from the supernatural events in the early part of the poem, the rebellion in heaven, the war in heaven, and so on, to an intimate domestic and psychological drama toward the end of the poem. By the end of the poem, the cosmic machinery dissolves, the struggle is interiorized. Uh, We're told in Book 12, Adam and Eve are promised that there's a paradise within thee, happier far. This elaborate cosmic fiction now becomes interiorized, the individual human soul. Eden would seem to have little to do with history, cosmic or otherwise, but it's important to understand that Eden is not a refuge from history. Remember what I said, Adam and Eve are having to make choices every minute of the day. Milton's use of the biblical story of the fall shows that individual choices can affect nothing less than the history of the entire created universe. Like the English people who have relinquished their liberty, Adam and Eve have made a disastrous choice. Eden is itself a historical realm of freedom where choices must be made. It's a place of contingency, of choice, and as such it requires the new heroism of patience and heroic fortitude. Individual human beings are faced in Milton's world with having to make individual choices within the darkness of history within the confusions of history, within the contingencies of history. That basic idea is fundamental to Milton's understanding of civic and religious liberty. For Milton, history, both before and after the fall, requires individual responsibility and difficult choices of conscience. In the last lines of the poem, Adam and Eve are expelled from Eden. The world was all before them, where to choose their place of rest and providence, their guide. You hear the Miltonic note there, where to choose. Adam and Eve, at the end of Paradise Lost, walk out of Eden into fallen history, carrying with them the responsibility we all carry, the responsibility to choose.